<laughs> Good morning, everyone. And aren't we glad we can stay inside today and still participate in our discussion on native plants? So welcome to the fourth presentation in the Camden Garden Club's annual Winter Horticultural Series. Just a reminder about next week's program, we will discuss tips and techniques so home gardeners can successfully propagate plants from seeds. And in case you're new to this program and are not familiar with the Garden Club, we are a nonprofit organization in support of the town of Camden for the past 116 years. The club puts up and maintains the hanging baskets from the downtown lamp posts in the summer, the Christmas trees during the holiday season, and the various flower displays around the downtown and surrounding areas. One of our very successful programs is providing scholarships to local graduates who plan to obtain a degree in one of the natural sciences. And last year, as a new project, we worked with the town's public works department to design the native planting beds that are part of the new downtown parking lot renovation. The club is also a partner in Camden's shade tree program. These activities are supported by our annual garden tour held the third Thursday in July, and we hope to see you there this summer. You can find more information and how you can join the garden club at camdengardenclub.org. So now it is my pleasure to introduce today's topic and speakers. The Native Gardens of Blue Hill has undertaken the creation of a public garden to give a diverse group of gardeners, potential gardeners, and the non-gardeners out there, the experience of a sustainably managed garden where beauty, value, and the appropriateness of natural plants are demonstrated. In creating this garden, Native Gardens envisions a process that teaches as the garden evolves and becomes an inspirational destination as it matures. Avi Clare and Kathy Reese co-founded the garden in 2015. And with the support and volunteer hours of many community members, it has become a valuable resource on the Blue Hill Peninsula and beyond. Native Gardens incorporated as a nonprofit in April, 2020. And with a dedicated working board of directors, the organization continues to grow and expand their programs. Today's presentation will cover the use of native plants in the garden and the services they provide to the ecosystem. So it is my pleasure to welcome Avi and Kathy to the Camden Garden Club's Winter Horticultural Series. So the native garden is only, um, I think four years old. We go, I think we're going into our fifth season, fourth or fifth season this year. So we're gonna be talking about some of our experiences at the garden and, um, why basically tell a little bit of our story, like why we think it's important that everybody adopt uh, some natives uh, for use in their garden and their landscape. So um, we like to call the garden the sort of the slow garden movement. It's pretty much built all with volunteer labor and um, it's taking quite a while to uh, cover a lot of ground. We have, uh, just about four acres that we need to cover. So we're working a little by little to um, turn as much of it as we can into garden and using strictly native plants that are native to me. All right, so I'll start with a little bit of a reality check. Um, so basically the humans have had some kind of effect on at least 85% of the Earth's land surface. There's, depending on what resource or what source you read, there might be slightly different uh, variations on that number. But, but if you really think about it, um, all our agriculture, our homes, our businesses, the transportation systems, our energy production, the power plants, and including solar and um, wind farms, mining, all these things have, um, we've basically disrupted the earth's surface to, to habitat this planet. Um, and although we can see that sometimes visibly on the ground, we don't see everything that's happening. And there's a lot of uh, microbial activity in, in the earth and other microscopic insects and things that we don't see. So we just have to realize that every time we basically put a shovel in the ground, we're doing something to that ground. So um, we've decided that to, in order to help a little bit with that, 
since we love our gardens and love to be out there, that while we're there, we should be trying to add more native plants because the native plants are pretty much the the base of the food web or the food chain, however you want to think of it, you know, they're the only <clears throat> form of life that can actually make food from the sun and everything, everything, everything relies on them. So um, they also provide a home to a lot of insects and the insects provide food for the birds and insects provide food for mammals and other things as well. And the plants themselves actually provide food for us. So um, we have the uh, larva for the American painted lady up there in the upper left-hand corner on a plantain leaved pusito, and that will turn into a beautiful butterfly. Those caterpillars, again, provide a lot of important food for birds, which are nesting right at the time that the caterpillars are out. Um, next to that, we have the um, larva of the Abbott's Sphinx moth. It's on a grape and it also uh, has a home or lays its, the adult lays its eggs on the Virginia creeper. And this is like an awesome caterpillar. It's like all the Sphinx moths. It's huge and it's amazing looking with that patterning. And it's always a, a thrill to find one. Unlike the tomato hornworms, uh, the sphinx moth has the courtesy to only lay one or two eggs, so it doesn't decimate your plant. But anyway, you get to enjoy that. And then the luna moth, I put that in there because the luna moth is actually doesn't even eat as an adult. Although some moths are pollinators, this one, it doesn't eat, it doesn't pollinate, it doesn't do anything. It's really just this beautiful thing there only for the purpose of reproducing. And the uh, bohemian waxwing there is eating the elderberry fruits. The red elder is not edible for humans, but the black elder is. And next to that, we have the shad bush, which um, you know has like a million names because people have thought it to be so important. Uh, service berry, June berry. Um, I've heard of a number of other ones as well. And then on the upper right, we have the uh, beaked hazelnut, which you know, don't need to say anymore. It's a hazelnut and uh, we love it and squirrels love it and a lot of wildlife love the nuts because they're very protein rich foods. They've all evolved together. All right, click the whole. Um, so here's a little bit more of some statistics. Um, you can see that how much water and other inputs that we put into the garden. But the good news is that native plants require very few inputs. In fact, they often prefer poor or poor or soils. And um, at the native garden, we only water to establish a plant, and that's that's our goal in general. You can see the slide on the right is a, a bed that we put in at the uh, at the native garden um, when we first arrived. Um, we never. We have never fertilized it. We have never watered it past its first um, planting. And I think this can show you how full and rich the uh, robust the plants can get. Um, this slide was taken, I think, this year after we planted them, those um, shrubs and plants. There's um, in the foreground of that picture, that's a clethra, the summer sweet. There's some bush honeysuckle. Um, the botanical name is deer vela. It's not actually a honeysuckle, but just wanted to point that out. And um, we have flowering raspberry, uh, New England aster. I think there's something else. Chelone, I think, is in there as well. Yes. So anyway, there's a variety of things in that bed. The soil was not necessarily rich. I think we might have added a little leaf mulch when we put it in. And, um, and that's all we have to do. Four years later, it's still looking great. So just a little bit more about the resilience of native plants. I recently learned that this um, fossil of our native uh, royal fern was found in Sweden a number of years ago. Uh, the fossil itself was 100 million years old, meaning that that plant 
that we see today has um, inhabited the earth since the time of the dinosaurs and has remained pretty much the same as it was then. So it has not really had to change even though it managed to survive the extinction of the dinosaurs and saber tooth tigers and all kinds of things. So um, I, if we're thinking about the future and um, changes in climate and other things, our natives are gonna be best positioned to cope with those uh, changes. So here we are at the native garden. Um, this garden is open to the public year round from dawn to dusk. And um, we have found that community members do come and walk our trails. We have a couple finished trails, one uh, handicap access trail as well. And um, we also host uh, what we have been calling mentor days. Because the garden is built entirely on volunteer labor, um, we have been relying on community members to come every other Friday morning during the summer, or actually from May through October, and um, put a few hours of time in and at, it's during that time that they get to learn about native plants and um, get um, experience with sustain, more sustainably managed gardens and, um, and also take some, have some investment in this, in this property. We've had repeat volunteers coming for the last four years and um, we've really been reaping the benefits of that. We also uh, have a like to point out that natives don't necessarily have to be uh, planted in what might be a wild space. They can be used in highly designed gardens as well. So um, at the Native Garden, we're hoping to kind of help out with a lot of other um, efforts going on locally. Um, so. Uh, Seed saving is one of them. And so having all of these native plants available, all setting seed, the public's welcome to come and um, take some seed home for themselves to start their own plants. Pollinator protection is another effort. Uh, so most people think about bees when they think about pollinators, but and our native bees are in a lot of trouble and need more food, basically. So pollen and nectar from our natives are gonna be helpful to them. But there are also bumblebees, other uh, sweat bees. There are a lot of different kinds of bees, flies, hawk moths that we just, I just mentioned with the sphinx moth, They're, they are pollinators as well, and also hummingbirds. So also uh, habitat restoration is something the site of the native garden has seen a lot of use over the years. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and also with our trails, this is the beginning of the new accessible trail. Uh, we hope to encourage a lot more outdoor activity uh, from the community members, people visiting the site. So this little trail leads to a small pond that's not very far away, but feels very re remote in the woods. Um, so um, this slide shows four different views of different places in the garden. We've, um, not all of the, the gardens, but here are some examples of different areas. So the top left is what we call this uh, patio garden and the summer house is, you can see it being constructed in the back. Um, that funny structure on the roof is the beginning of the components of a uh, green roof that we have started to establish on, on it. Um, that bridge is a handicap accessible bridge. Um, we got a grant from the Maine Community Foundation to build two bridges like that. And, um, and this patio garden is focused on the alpine plants, the, the, mostly the diminutive plants. Um, and the soils here are very gravelly. Uh, and we, it's hard to see in this picture, but those stone pieces are like, uh, become uh, like separations for the little beds so that we can highlight 
individual species of alpine plants in each open space between those stepping stones. Um, the, below that is the performance hall and woodland hollow gardens. That building was the only building that was really finished when we first arrived at the campus. And we haven't mentioned that this four acre site belongs to the Bagaduce Music, um, another nonprofit in town. And at the time we were looking for a, a garden space, they had just acquired this property and couldn't figure out what to do with four acres of grounds and heard that we were looking for a home. So it became kind of a win-win where we have a relationship with them where we take care of the grounds and, um, and they get to reap the benefits actually. <laughs> so it works pretty well. Anyway, that, um, that building was complete and it was the first place we could start do, to do anything. And the first thing we really did was basically clean it up and you'll see some slides of the before and after a little bit later in, the, in this presentation. On the top right is the only place in the, on the campus that we had to start with bare ground. Generally, we tend to try to work with what's there and do what we call editing, um, weeding out or managing what's already there and, and then augmenting it with, with new things and native, other native plants that we could bring into those spaces. But here we had a situation where this new building was built up on top of a slope. You saw the picture early on with the library building. Um, now that slope was already um, populated with plants in that first picture. And um, when this ground got uh, graded and uh, it was just too hot in the summer to even consider planting. So we decided that we would at least illustrate what was going to happen here. And we did that through um, patterns of mulch and wood chips. Now, if we didn't have so much ground to cover, we probably wouldn't have um, purchased and, and put on so much brown mulch, but it was one of those situations where that was what we had to do. Um, we didn't have the leaf mulch to put on such a large space. So where the wood chips are on the ground is where the woody things are gonna go into that garden, the shrubs like um, summer sweet and uh, sheep's laurel and huckleberry and a um, uh, few others, I think um, some other woody, woody things. And then the perennials would go in the mulch. And below is an area of the garden we call the teaching garden. And this is in our first fall at the garden space. We did uh, made some nursery beds using sheet layers of uh, Kind of a sheet mulching method where we took some of the resources that were there, seaweed, um, garden waste, we have a local coffee roaster so we got coffee grounds from him, leaves that we had raked up, twigs and some straw and by the next spring we were able to plant in that bed um, the plugs that we were holding there until we the garden spaces were ready for them. Are we ready? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so here, here we're um, going to talk a little bit about how we use the native plants around the garden. So in this case, we're right up by that library building, and which has a very large roof that is shedding a lot of water all down that slope that you saw. So we decided um, that we would need to grade that carefully to sort of retain water and move it slowly down that slope down to the bottom where we could go through a culvert under the driveway. So we decided on uh, bayberry and alder as uh, the theme in this, in this part of the garden. So the, we are, we chose the speckled alder because it's really a, I guess I would just say an underappreciated and underused uh, small tree that has a lot of wildlife value. You know, it's one of the first trees to uh, produce pollen and is really valuable for pollinators in that sense. 
like queen bees just trying to get their nest going have to find that pollen early in the spring. So this is one of, it's a real benefit to the bees. So we are planning to prune that alder so that it rises above the bayberry and keep the bayberry a little bit lower. Uh, so at this moment, it's sort of in its adolescent, like gangly adolescent stage, but that alder is gonna rise up above the uh, bayberry. We're gonna keep it pruned to a beautiful shape and so that people can see really just how beautiful our native alder can be. Can you real quickly, uh, we had a question come in asking how exactly do you define native plants? So for Blue Hill, um, are you only including plants that would be found in Hancock County or are you talking about, how far does native go? Is it the whole Eastern North America? <laughs> well, people can de define native um, in a lot of different ways, but for the native garden, we have decided that we are just gonna use plants that are native to Maine. It's just an exercise in showing what our state has as native plants. We could define that even further, or narrow it down, or we could broaden that up. But we just thought that that was a, it's arbitrary to some extent, but we just decided that that would be our definition of native for the sake of the garden. Perfect, thank you. We appreciate the clarification. So here's a before and after picture of that performance hall we looked, we saw it before in that um, slide with the four images. And you can see that um, this on the left, that's what it looked like when we first arrived. To the right of the building is the site where the library building is now has been built. Um, and this picture on the right is probably four, three or probably four years later. And what we did was we, um, planted white birch and bayberry and huckleberry in this area. Um, we love the birches. They just grow really quickly and they can very quickly establish a, wood, a woodsy-like feeling. Those birch were, um, some of them were baby whips when we put them in four years ago. A couple were, I'd say maybe uh, inch caliber sapling. And you can see how fast they grew and how quickly they screened that building and how absolutely necessary it was to kind of give that building a little screening. So the, there were a lot of things that had happened on that site before we got there. The library had taken it over and put in a gigantic parking lot in order to do that, they basically cut a square, a rectangle out of the woods uh, to install the parking lot. So we needed to soften that edge a bit uh, between the parking lot and the woods. So we started by thinning the woods out and then on that edge. And you can see in that bottom photo left all the brush or the small saplings and that we took out of that edge to sort of break it up a little bit. And in the upper uh, left-hand photo, we're uh, trying to repopulate that area with, with shrubs, native shrubs. So by using the shrubs to sort of go from low to high and sort of inter intermingle into the woods we, we're trying to have a smoother transition rather than an abrupt one like we had in the beginning. So that we're using cardboard and uh, wood chips as a mulch to sort of suppress a lot of the weeds that came up in the disturbed soils adjacent to the parking lot. And on the right hand couple of photos, those are in that area, the Woodland Hollow that Evie described before next to the performance hall. So we had, uh, planted more thoroughly around the edges, the pathways, so that people could see the native plants up close. And then in, we're just kind of managing the native vegetation in the center, what Amy called editing earlier. So basically weeding out the things that <clears throat> are congesting the area or not letting in enough light. So some saplings, <clears throat> some small small trees. We did a lot of limbing up there to let in a little bit more light. 
And that's pretty much just gonna evolve on its own. We did put in a few plants like that golden ragwort on the upper right hand corner that intermingles so nicely with the ferns that were already there. We did have a question come in that was related to the previous slide with the alders. Um, Carrie asks, are young alders sensitive to transplanting and do they remain short and bushy when pruned? And also there's another question after that. So why don't we answer those first two? Um, I've had pretty good luck. And that alder was an alder that we transplanted into that location. So I think it depends on where they're growing to begin with and how easy they are to dig out. And you might consider doing some root pruning in the fall and then moving in the spring like in that time right before the buds begin to swell, that's kind of the time of year when you can pretty much move anything and it doesn't really affect it much. And yes, you can just keep them pruned. You can um, prune down certain stems and they will remain bushy like a shrub if that's the kind of look you want. In the case of the garden, we're trying to have a small tree. So we're sort of doing the opposite of that. However, they're really uh, adaptable and they grow quickly and they're easy to manage into whatever shape you're interested in. That's great to hear. Um, uh, there's more parts of that question. Uh, did you say it was okay as a building foundation planting? If so, which direction or side is best? I'm not sure I understand the question. Okay, maybe Carrie can type a little bit more into the chat box and we can go back to that later. So oh, I, I was interpreting, I guess, is, is there um, a good side of the building that would be appropriate to plant on? To plant alder? To plant the yeah. alder, yeah. No, it does, it does like soils that are a little bit wetter. Um, that would be something to think about. In that spot, we actually kind of graded the soil so that it would be a little bit of a basin to hold the water as it came down the roof. Um, so that, but it can, it's adaptable. It can live in drier soils as well. Okay. Um, and so she did, uh, or Carrie did elaborate a little bit more and says, was the pick of it beside a building? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And it, it's not really right next to it, like a typical foundation planting. I would say it's probably about 10 feet away. Maybe you think that's about yeah, right? Yeah, probably. Feet. And there's bayberry between it. Um, it do, I don't think the roots are going to bother a foundation if that's part of the question. Okay, thank you so much. I think that I think that answers it. Okay. Um, so this is a slide of not the native garden. It's a but it's showing another situation where you might want to think about how to transition from cultivated to uncultivated areas. As you can see in the foreground of this picture, um, you can see this this stone wall of, of a courtyard and there's a house right behind it. And so all this ground was quite open because of the house and the, you know, the building of the house. But the, but the setting was a lot of woods and it was, it's a nice idea to bring some sense of the woods into the gardens around the house. And although these native shrubs that you see in this, in this photo, there's the spice bush um, oh, and um, the swamp azalea, which, besides its name, doesn't really need to live in wet soils, can do quite well in dry soils and the uh, summer sweet. So those are things that just as another idea is not only are you editing, but sometimes you have to bring it in. And so it's just another idea of softening that, that space between the open and the, uh, and the woods. So at the Native Garden, I mentioned that we inherited a lot of different soil conditions and things. So at the front of the property, a lot, uh, they had basically used that area as a parking lot and they put about six inches of very gravelly soil down just to, to help with the parking. So it, we decided that instead of uh, removing that soil and then bringing in new soil, we decided just to try to amend the soil as it is and using uh, other materials on site, like uh, prunings, twigs, leaves. Um, and again, we added some seaweed and uh, plant waste into these piles that we're sort of allowing to compost in place. 
and we're going to be planting in a lot of those this spring. And the other strategy is to use uh, nitrogen fixing plants, which in that lower left hand picture that's a sweet fern there it isn't really a fern but a shrub, which uh, is capable of fixing nitrogen so adding a lot more nutrition, uh, nitrogen availability to the soil so other things can live there. And uh, just as an aside, we're, we're really extolling the virtues of the alder here. The alder is another nitrogen fixing plant. So also very good for disturbed soils and places where uh, that are very lean and really it's um, kind of difficult to get a lot of things that you would typically think of as garden plants to grow. So um, then it comes down to how to choose plants for your own gardens. And one of the things we like to um, say over and over again is observation is so important. So observing nature and learning from nature is, is the, be the beginning. Um, if you can understand some of the basic conditions on your site, that will help. Although, as we're going to say over and over, many plants are adaptable. So experimentation is also a really, um, we, we encourage us a lot of that as well. And it's always easy to move a plant if it doesn't work in one spot the next year. Um, another thing to consider when you're looking, thinking about plants is the seasonal interest, not only the visual interest to you, but also think about the, um, ha the wildlife and having things that pollinate in the early spring and in the late fall are always good um, things to consider. Also, when you're looking at plants, just think about their natural size and its natural habit. If you don't wanna do a lot of maintenance and a lot of fussing, that is gonna be an important thing to consider. And then learning how the plants spread, how and through their roots and also how they reseed is another way of um, thinking about how to place plants as well as how to propagate and, um, and, and, and increase your plant inventory. Um, the other thing that we like to talk about, we did, I did say, you know, experimentation is always good, but we as gardeners are collaborating with nature. And so we're going to alter nature's rules of competition. For instance, a lot of wetland plants are considered wetland plants because they're the ones that can compete in those conditions better than other plants. And so they may proliferate in those locations. And if you see a field of Rhodora in a, in a wetland in this early spring, that's just because no other plant can survive as easily as that Rhodora can in that, in that setting. But that doesn't mean that you can't bring it into another kind of location and and um, give it a different and give it its own um, space in another place and change those rules of competition. Um, that said, certain conditions can impact plants' behavior. It, it's not going to grow as bushy if it's in a shady spot as it might be growing fuller in a sunny spot. And also we have the ability to prune and shape our um, anything we bring into the garden, not only the shrubs and trees, but also you can prune and shape perennial things, herbaceous perennials as well. So that all that said, we are trying uh, somewhat to match the plants to their native habitats because on the site, the one really great thing about it is there is a lot of diversity of habitat and a lot of uh, different conditions. So this is the library building again. And then that upper left-hand side, the right-hand side, that's where the alder and the bayberry are. And the left-hand side of the entrance, that's where we planted a, a group of beech plum. The beech plum is really adaptable as the name suggests, it likes sandy, droughty soils. And a lot of times when you have a building foundation, uh, they use soil to backfill around the sand, or they, excuse me, they use sand to backfill around the foundation. And uh, so the soil ends up being very sharply drained. 
So in this case, we just decided let's not amend the soil. Let's just plant something that can cope with those conditions. So we put in the stand beach plum. So also on that library slope at the top, we have a couple, um, and then at the bottom we have those, again, as Kathy said, different conditions. You can see on the top, the um, yellow wild indigo, which is a wonderful plant if you don't know it, it's highly recommended. And next to it is bearberry and also um, pussy toes. And I see one dandelion leaf in the front of the picture. <laughs> and so, <laughs> um, but those are things that all like um, quick draining, dry, hot conditions. And down below, there's a picture of the Rodora in front of some marsh marigold. And that's the bottom of the slope where, as Kathy mentioned before, the way we're controlling the drainage down that slope, we are channeling it into an area near a culvert. And, um, and that's the place that gets quite wet. And these are the plants that like those conditions. So that's where they went. So another plant that we really like is called Sweet Gale or Mirica Gale. In the wild, it lives along uh, the edges of uh, lakes and ponds, as you can see in the upper left-hand photo. But it's a, a beautiful plant. It has fragrant like, um, um, like bayberry. It has a very similar fragrance. And uh, it has this kind of bluish color, which is very pretty and can be used to offset other plants. So we're using it in the native garden in on the, the edge of a ditch, basically, um, where it's not gonna have the kind of uh, regular water that it has in its natural habitat. But we found that that plant can survive in a lot of different conditions. It can survive in the full sun, it can survive in the part shade, it can survive in an ordinary garden soil, as well as um, in a very poor clay kind of soil. So this is one that we know is very adaptable and has a lot of wonderful benefits for the garden and is particularly beautiful and has a wonderful fragrance. And um... If you're thinking of something to use as a screen or as those in the trend or a transition or as a mid story in a landscape, in that middle layer, um, there are a few different shrubs that are adaptable for those spots. And this one is the um, Acer, fol uh, the Viburnum Acer folium, the maple leaf Viburnum. Um, it's got a, a a way of being a lot fuller in the shade than some other shrubs might be. So, and as, as well as it also being on the edge. So it does get a, a bit of light. Other shrubs that may also be used in these kinds of situations could be something like witch hazel or the, um, the other hazels, the nut hazels. Um, wild raisin is another viburnum that can be useful in this setting. The low bush blueberry does okay in some shade. Winterberry, especially if it's a little bit wet soil. So these are the ideas you have for transitioning from um, or screening. So here's just a picture of the witch hazel. Um, you know, it blooms in my garden, November, December-ish. So that's really a very late bloomer. Uh, usually, uh, I, I read that it's pollinated by hoverflies during the day and these moths called owlet moths at night. So these are some insects that really need this late source of nectar and pollen. Um, so this is a great, here we're showing it growing in the open, but this actually no, naturally grows in a more wooded situation with a lot more shade. So it can be very happy in different kinds of conditions. Some other small trees that you can use on the edge of the woods or actually grading into the woods would be the shad bush or the alternate leaf dogwood are some other great 
uh, trees slash rugs that you can try. Um, and now we're coming back to some different birches. Um, we really do love birches because they're, like I said before, they're quick to grow and establish. Um, the cherry birch is not actually native to our part of Maine up in on the coast and on down east. It's more native down south, but we wanted to have a representation of every birch in the garden. And we already had gray birch, yellow birch, and paper birch growing naturally there as well as the ones we put in. So here's, we decided to use the cherry birch as a specimen tree in, in one location. And the gray birch, that picture was taken maybe two years after we planted tiny little whips. Um, and uh, that'll be an, a nice screening. The gray birch has a quaking kind of leaf similar to the poplar. So we thought it might be nice next to the music library to have a tree that could offer some sound. And the way we planted this, it, when it fully grows, there'll be a narrow path that you can walk through to the back half of the, um, into those woods in the back. So, well, Going from trees to ground covers, we're trying to cover every layer here. So uh, bearberry is one of our favorites. It, you can see on the left, it's growing basically on rock. And on the right, it's growing on the edge of the woods. I found that it really likes a lean soil. It does not want to be in a regular moist humus or um, like compost rich situation. And if it's on a slope, it typically does better. In this case, the canopy is very high, so it's getting some light. It really doesn't like to be in a lot of shade. Anyway, this is one that we are using alongside paths uh, as or as the ground cover layer. Um, another slide that's not the native garden, as you can tell, there's some astilbe very visible in this picture, but we wanted to sh continue the conversation about that ground layer and um, bunchberry is another plant that we also like to use quite a bit as a edging to a path. And you can see it in different stages, um, the winter frosty look the in the berry and in the flower. Um, it's a good, um, you, in this picture, you can kind of get a sense that it can be easily mixed under other perennials so that you have that mid story in this photograph as being the perennials. And then there's the canopy of the trees above. Speaking of the ground cover, we did have a question come in from June who was asking what would be good ground cover for a sunny area. Well, the bearberry and the pussy toes, um, blueberry saw, you know, low bush blueberry can be a ground cover. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the native. Kathy, jump in if I'm not remembering anything. <laughs> um, I don't know. It's so Very great. Sunny. Um, pussy toes and Pussy toast grows really well and quick too. That's the other thing. It's, yeah, if it's it has a nice gravelly. silver foliage. Yeah, it's, it does have. Um, bearberry can be a little bit fussier, just to warn you. It can sometimes get a little black on the leaves. It's like a botrytis. If it happens, just cut it out. Don't worry about it and never water it. Never water bearberry. All right, thank you. Oh, someone also mentioned strawberries for ground cover. Oh, strawberries, oh, yeah. yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I knew there was something else out there. And someone also mentioned poison ivy, but. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead, continue, please. All right, so mosses can also be a great ground cover. In the left-hand photo, this is not the native, neither of these are the native garden either, but we used it to kind of um, help create this drainage area. So we um, define the area, this like trench almost using rocks and then filled in behind them and then covered the whole thing with moss. 
so that it really just looked more like a, a green area rather than a black area, which it always was with water standing there. On the right, we're using the moss in between these big flagstones there. And while moss seems like it might not have a very big ecological value, it really does provide habitat for other insects like lightning bugs lay their eggs in mosses. And, um, and so there are insects there that birds can eat and other things. So it really is like a little micro habitat uh, in the moss. So um, here we're gonna talk a little bit more about some specific perennial plants. And one, these are three perennials that we have, native perennials that we've discovered do have a tendency to reseed quite a bit, which can be a little bit of a nuisance, but it can also be um, of, of value if you're establishing a garden. And um, in the early spring, it's easy to move those seedlings around to put them in places that you want. And if you don't want so much seed dropping on the ground and too many seedlings to weed out, you can always deadhead those seed heads off the plants. But we encourage you to consider leaving the stems because those stems are nesting spaces for little insects over the winter and, um, and do the other cutting later in the spring, you know, finish cutting down the garden later in the spring. So one of our favorite plants is the swamp milkweed, um, basically because it, it's not a very long-lived plant, but it tends to stay put compared to the, um, the milkweed that you see in a lot of fields, the common milkweed. So it also provides all the great nectar and um, habitat for the larva, the monarch, and other butterflies and moths as well. So this one we found it doesn't really seed around very much. And I'm not sure why that is. Maybe it's because we're always collecting the seeds. Just thought of it. <laughs> anyway, uh, you might find it to be different in your garden, but it stays put, it's very well behaved. And um, this is sort of the opposite of the couple that we showed you just before. Um, and then uh, we also always like to encourage less lawn and to um, consider the ideas around turning a portion of your lawn into a meadow. And you can do that in a very small yard. I have, this is just an open field, but um, obviously somebody's decided to mow it in a certain way to create paths and also to create some kind of interest um, because things are, growing, you know, there's, there's geometry, there's uh, like a structure to this meadow because there's some things that are allowed to be tall and some things that are mowed down. Um, so I'm not clear what the strategy is on this field since um, it's a roadside field, the picture, Kathy took the picture, but it's possible that the um, woody things that I can see in the foreground, it looks like meadow sweet, but one of the native spireas, um, will bounce back from an occasional bush hog. So maybe every couple of years, three years, it gets whacked down so that things stay a little bit low or else um, it might even be a situation where you let those areas um, continue to grow, don't mow them down and maybe some trees would grow into those spaces and again, bring a sense of transition into that woods behind it. So it wouldn't look like just a two dimensional uh, playing with this wall of woods in the back, it would have the potential of being a more integrated landscape, depending on how you strategize things and what your one is interested in having there. But again, just consider the mowing strategies of a lawn and also consider the fact that most meadows, I think it's typical that people mow their meadows in the fall after the nesting birds have left. And, but think about the nesting insects and perhaps if the meadow isn't too wet, in the spring, you could consider mowing it in the early spring just before the new growth emerges. So if you are interested in um, trying to transition more to natives, you're gonna wanna do something about the invasives. So at the native garden, we're fortunate in that we really only have bittersweet, but I'm 
one uh, strategy is to just understand what your your foe looks like as a seedling. And so we're showing the on the left hand the uh, immature bittersweet plants and um, some barberry plants next to them or below them, excuse me. So we find that in the fall is a really good time. Um, Any time is really a good time, but in the fall, the bittersweet particularly turns yellow and it, it's like a beacon. You can just go right to it, do what you need to do. So you can clip it and that, that way you're not disturbing the soil, and, but you need to be coming back to keep on clipping any, any of the invasives because there's a lot of uh, carbohydrates stored in the roots and they'll just sprout back. So clipping is a good strategy if you can just stay on it. It's easy, much easier than pulling. So in the middle photo, she's pulling. In this case, there's so much, there's gonna be soil disturbance anyway. We're just gonna pull it out. The upper right, we're using this tool called a weed wrench, which really, it grabs the stem of the plant right close to the ground and they're like a lever. Uh, she's pulling on the lever and there's a little fulcrum in the back and it closes the jaws of this thing around the base of the plant and yanks it out by the roots. It's really like a powerful tool, but you got to be careful because you can hurt yourself with it too. But anyway, that's another strategy. Just if you're, if you're pulling things out by the roots, you really want to try to cover that bare soil with leaves or whatever you have, because when, when you have that bare soil, that's what these seeds love to germinate in. So you're going to get regen, you know, you're going to get these seedlings coming up that you'll have to pull out again. And at the native garden, we decided that it wasn't going to be responsible to cart off our invasives full of seeds to some other site. So we decided to just compost them right there. So we covered it with a tarp so that the birds would not see the seeds and continue feeding on them and or the fruits, continue feeding on the fruits and then dropping the seeds elsewhere. So we, we just kind of have this giant pile that we keep adding to each year and we're at least containing the problem rather than letting it spread. Speaking of foes uh, in the garden, Alyssa mentions that she's looking to do a native garden right at the edge of the ocean and that the area has a great deal of poison ivy. And she wanted to know if you have any recommendations for naturally getting rid of poison ivy. <laughs> I, I would just say by these same strategies, clipping or pulling, but you're gonna have to suit up to do that, especially if you are, yeah, I see somebody there suggesting goats, that might be a really good one. <laughs> I think we all need one of those weed wrenches. They're pretty spectacular. <laughs> you can do a lot of work with one of those. <laughs> it's awesome. It's, put, it's going to my Mother's Day list. <laughs> <laughs> all right, go ahead. Okay, we're winding down and um, we just wanted to um, give you a few uh, notes about how one might obtain some plants. So first of all, um, celebrate and cultivate what you already have. And we've been talking a little bit about that throughout this program and, you know, editing, moving, pruning, grooming, all those things can, you can just really spiff up a landscape with a little handwork. Um, you can, there's division, dividing plants is a great way to get plants with your neighbors or friends have any, or if there's a native growing on someplace on your property that you want to move into your garden, that um, that's another option you have. Collecting seeds is a good way of starting a lot of plants. There, um, we have developed some strategies for winter sowing in milk jugs, as, and I know Wild Seed Project offers a lot of workshops and in, information on their site as well for winter sowing of seeds. Um, and then, of course, one of the things we like to do at the, at the Native Garden is host a native plant sale every spring and try to encourage native sustainably grown um, native plants and buying locally is, is one of our missions. So um, here's a list of a couple, a few local main nurseries that we have worked with um, that we have shopped at and some of them even come to Blue Hill for our native plant sale. 
which this year it's either going to be the Saturday of Memorial Day weekend or maybe that next Saturday. We haven't determined the date yet. But we, if you join our mailing list, you can um, get notices for our programs and the plant sale will be on one of those programs. Is, can you pre-order for the plant sale? Um, last year, because of COVID, we had a slightly different situation and we did open up to some kind of uh, pre-order. Different nurseries had different um, uh, ways of pre-ordering. We are just hosting it like a farmer's market. We're not, we're, it's really the, the nurseries come in and set up their stand there. So what happened was people could pre-order and the nurseries was, were packaging up those orders and, and then um, people came and we did a curbside kind of pickup. We might end up doing that again this year. Um, before that, we didn't have any pre-ordering uh, availability. Oh, thank you very much. So this is the end of our talk and um, you, there's our website and address and, um, and we're open to more questions. Oh, super, because we, we've got a lot of good questions here. Um, all right, so Wanda asks, is there a website with names and illustrations of plants native to Maine? <laughs> Helen, Helen answered and said, uh, try Go Botany, and yeah. she has that at gobotany.nativeplanttrust.org. Um, do you agree with that or do you have any That's other a really good one. We okay. use it a lot. Any other suggestions? Yeah. Uh, well, if you want us uh, to see a list, we do have a small list of what we are considering garden worthy native plants on our website. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there are some photos, but not photos of every plant. And we are in the process of working on these plant profiles where you can learn a lot more about each plant, but that's not quite online yet, but it's in the works. Oh, good. Something to look forward to. Mm -hmm. um, Cheryl asks, would any of the ground covers do well under bird feeders? Ooh, that's tricky because you're going to have a lot, potentially a lot of seed dropping there and weeding. Um, so um, that would be the only concern I would have. I don't think the birds would, you know, do any, mess it up in any way. Now, I think just go by your habitat, you know, whatever. If you've got sun, full sun, choose something that works in full sun. At my uh, feeder, the turkeys are a constant <laughs> presence and they have cleared the area. It is like, like even an inch of soil is now gone from their scratching. So be <laughs> careful what you plant there. <laughs> that's, that's a very good tip. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Julie says, isn't moss hard to transplant? What tricks do you have? Oh, I think notice where it comes from and try to duplicate those conditions is the biggest. And it also likes, we found that it grows pretty well on clay-like soils. So sometimes we even just smear like a coating of clay soil on the ground before we plant moss into it. And um, don't be afraid to stomp on it and really get good contact and soak it down. All right, and to kind of build on that moss question, um, Susan wants to know, is there a moss that does well in sun? Some of them. Um, I think that the, um, what's called hair cat moss, that one does the best in sun. It's a larger moss, it kind of builds up a big layer like sphagnum. So when you dig it up, it can be very thick, um, but it does like to have uh, moisture. So it can survive the sun, but it needs to have sort of a constant source of moisture as well. And when it does dry out, it does shrink up and it's not quite as attractive and fluffy, but it'll come right back when you water, when the water's returned. And Kathy, can you repeat the name of that one again? Hair cap moss. Hair. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and speaking of low plantings, uh, Susan also asks, are there any suggestions for low plantings along the road where there's a lot of road salt? Ah, uh, yes. Deer Vela is one of our favorite. That's the bush honeysuckle. Deer Vela lanicera is the botanical name. And it can, it really, you'll see it on the ditches along the sides of the roads and it can really take the road salt. Um, there's also a grass that has started to appear, at least in our area on the, on the, it's a salt marsh grass that 
according to Go Botany, is getting a, is getting a little invasive in our area, which means just what I would call aggressive because it's showing up in the ditches. But it's a beautiful grass, kind of wiry. It's a juncus, um, and it has got a dark, deep, almost black-like tone to it at the sides of the road. So that's another if you're looking for something you know a little more delicate. But the deer, the bush honeysuckle is gonna really fit the bill. And I think um, sweet fern, I think can take some salt too. Road yeah. salt. Yeah. And that they also, those are two things, the sweet fern and the, and the bush honeysuckle that like poor soils, do well in poor soils. And, um, and yeah, so I, those are two very ones that come to mind. Thank and you. I, I'd like to add the native rose, like the Carolina rose to that list. It has all the same beautiful uh, characteristics as any rose, but it lives very happily on the roadside. Thank you. I wrote those down because that's a big problem at our house. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and Creedy says, with an interesting name, is milkweed a medicinal? No. <laughs> I, think I think it's called milkweed because the sap is white and milky looking, mm -hmm. but it also has a lot of poisons in it. And that's why the monarch butterfly larva um, eats that presumably they eat the leaves that have that uh, milky sap and they are then themselves poisonous. So it's, no, I don't think there's, although I have heard of sort of eating the pods, but don't, no. Don't do that. No. <laughs> don't do it. Uh, well, Helen, boilings. <laughs> yeah, Helen mentions milkweed has uh, cardiac glycosides in it or glycosides in it, uh, actually dangerous even to some animals. Um, yeah. So again, speaking of milkweed, how much sun does swamp milkweed need? It's the more sun it gets, the better it'll flower. And I would say if it, it can't take anything but light shade, you know, if you really want it to perform. Okay. Um, Amy mentions that Maine Audubon and also Wild Seed Project have had plant sales this past year and maybe will again. So those are uh, mm -hmm. other resources. Thank you for including those in the chat. Um, and then Susan says, if I come to your gardens during the winter, what might I see? <laughs> well, since our gardens are fairly new, um, some of the places, depending on how much snow is on the ground, uh, there's not going to be too much to see in some areas. Of course, all the shrubs will be there. So you'll be able to sort of see the garden structure. Uh, you, and uh, we have left our plant tags standing this winter too. So um, if you see a stem of something, you might be able to identify it using the plant tag. Um, but we're trying to improve the garden for more year round interest and uh, accessibility. So the, we're having more walking paths and other things like that. So there'll be opportunity to walk around more and hopefully see more as the garden develops. Um, Maria asks if you know of any sources for native plants in the Camden Lincolnville area. Well, Belfast is not yeah. too far, and that Rebel Hill is and Honey Petal, and there's I think Blue Aster Gardens. Those I'll put those slides up back up again. Um, those are all in and Fernwood. Those are all in outside of Belfast. Oh, great! So they're our neighbors. Perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Beverly says, my columbine are routinely defoliate, they get routinely defoliate by caterpillars. Is there a sacrificial plant that I can put nearby mm. to keep this from happening? Oh, right. Those are like probably leaf miners too. Yes, um, they are leaf miners, but I'm afraid they're really specific to columbine. Yeah, the one so, of the things I've discovered is that if after it blooms, you can just kind of trim the plant back and a new flush of leaves might come. And usually that, doesn't it's maybe off season for those um, leaf miners and it usually comes and looks really good after a second flush of leaves. Well, we have uh, one last comment and um, Philip says, uh, I believe in World War II, milkweed was used to make life jackets. That's really interesting. I'd never heard that before. <laughs> oh, was it life jackets? I thought, I th was there also something with parachutes too? 
Also, well, the fibers from the stem are used for weaving. Uh, it's sort of like flax, I guess. I pulled apart the stem. It's very oh. hard to break the stem. The fibers are very strong. So maybe that's what they're using. Wow. Okay. That makes sense that, you know, if you compare it to flax, sure. Um, someone else just typed in that uh, Troy Howard Middle School Gardens Growing Natives are running a sale in the spring and seeds currently are available at Belfast Co-op. Um, so that's helpful. Excellent. Well, that's good. so great to have so many native plant sales around the state. I, We're so it, excited. Yeah, it's, no, it's wonderful. There's lots of resources out there. This is this is great. And of course, your website, which is up on the screen, um, nativemaingardens.org. Um, Avi and Kathy, thank you so much. I have taken a lot of notes and I'm going to go back and watch this program again um, because I have a lot that I want to apply to my own yard. So from the selfish perspective, thank you for doing this talk. <laughs> Um, I wanted to remind everybody out there that we have one more talk in the Camden Garden Club Winter Horticulture Series that will be next Tuesday um, at 9.30 a.m. If you have attended this talk, I'll go ahead and send you an automatic link to get into next Tuesday's talk. Um, tell your friends, tell your family, they're welcome to join us too. And again, we'll be posting the recording from this program on the Camden Public Library Program's YouTube channel uh, this afternoon, so you'll be able to find it there if you want to watch it again, go back for these great tips. Um, once again, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Of course. Bye -bye. Have a great, have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.